everybody doing tonight? Awesome. Well, uh, we're just so uh, just blessed tonight uh, and this weekend. Of course, how many just love Paul, Keith, and Amy? They're just amazing. Um, I think I said this last time, but, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I think you are the, our most, I don't know how, to know how to say this properly, but the person who's come as a guest speaker the most in, our, in the history of our church. And isn't that amazing? That is just, so, we're so grateful. And, you know, he doesn't, you know, you guys don't just come to speak. There's also an impartation and... And it's, you know, just a, a really significant impact, not just in, in Frontline, but also in, in Canada. And I think uh, I've seen that. I've seen uh, the fruit of what you guys carry. And, we're, you know, we were just talking about this, but just having, having people that um, just really value the kingdom of God and, 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 uh, and just a commitment in terms of friendship, but also just to what God's doing in this region. And so we're, we're very blessed. We're very honored uh, to have you guys here. Let's just give a warm welcome uh, for Paul, Keith, and Amy Davis. All righty. Thank you very much. You may be seated. I'm just going to be up for just a moment. This is my wife, Amy. Who's, how many of you have never heard us, have never heard, there's a few that have never heard us, okay, 23, that's the number of years that I'm older than her, now, now that that's, now that that's resolved, you can pay attention to what we have to say, right, so, because I, I could feel you, I could feel it back there behind me, I'm thinking somebody is wondering how many years, that's, that's the thing about being prophetic, so you got, you got to, and so, okay, the Lord said, just get up there and tell them how many years, and that way they can now pay attention to the rest of what we have to say. So anyway, but, but now your next thought is, but gosh, he doesn't look 23 years older, right? <laughs> that is what you were thinking, right? Her face is red, mine's not. So anyway, listen, we just, um, very honored to be here. This is one of our favorite places and the whole earth to go. And we love it here. We consider you guys family, front line, but also our Canadian. How many of our family, a table family are here? Quite a number. Oh, yeah. How wonderful that is. And we're going to be doing um, a baptism tomorrow. And um, for those of you that would like to be a part of that, uh, our table guys are going to be baptized. And then if there's some extras, if some of you folks would like to be baptized, we... Um, we're going to do a little teaching tomorrow about why we baptize the way we do. Hey, Wendy. And, um, and also, you know, um, we feel like there's something about baptisms right now. The Lord is blessing them. And we've had so many miraculous, wonderful things happen. And I know if I tell too many testimonies, everybody's going to show up tomorrow and want to be baptized. But we believe for a lot of people, it is a washing away of the old and stepping into the new. I mean, even if you've been baptized before, you know, there is a proper way of being baptized in the New Testament apostolic way. But also there's been something about this season we have been in that's been difficult. It's been a little ugly, maybe. And um, some of us haven't done it perfectly. And so we feel like, okay, I want a fresh start. I want to wash away the old step into the new. But so if, you, uh, if there's some of you guys that want to be, you know, um, Maybe, how many people have planned to be baptized tomorrow? Can we get a show of hands? That's what, two, uh, it's about 25 or so, whatever. Okay, if you choose to between now and then, uh, we can surely work that in and let you be a part of that. And um, my wife is going to share first, but, but before I do, um, we have some. There we are, good. We've got some books back there. Hers is probably way better than mine. So if you're going to buy one, buy hers. But if you're going to buy two, get both of them. But um, we'll talk a little bit about that. No, both books are really significant. I had an angel step into my um, hotel room uh, some time ago. There's our new uh, QR code graph that you can scan the code, and it takes you to um, our, app. our app and these different things. We have, I have 64 
podcasts that we have done primarily on the book of Revelation, several video blogs that both of us have done. Then we have our table meeting that we do on Sunday night that uh, many of you have been a part of. So that's just a little bit of an easier way to plug in with what we're doing and, uh, and write many articles as well. And she just got through writing a 13-page article that's a must-read. I contributed about two pages. She wrote 11. So uh, she was kind enough to let me put my name on it too. But she actually wrote most of the article. But it's very, very um, strategic for where we are. If you want to get a little bit of a pulse of where we are, we're going to talk a little bit about it this weekend because we feel like we've entered a little span of time right now that's different. It's a unique season. And we believe on the first of Tishri, which was... Was, was the Feast of Trumpets, which we're kind of in this 21-day span of time right now that uh, is very significant, the Feasts of the Seventh Month. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. It was kind of interesting. I just happened to notice we we came through customs today, and and we had to do a little photographs, you know, and oh, my gosh, it was awful. I mean, I looked at them, and I told her, I said, gosh, if I was the customs guy, I'd arrest them. They looked like Bonnie and Clyde. It was awful. We did. We looked like fugitives from the law. Her eyes were closed, and and I'm looking at it like, where do I look like this? And it snaps the picture, and I'm like, oh, my Lord. But it was interesting because the, the number, though, on our little card was 21. I thought that's kind of, that's a little little affirmation. We're in a little 21-day season of time right now that is affiliated or associated with the Feasts of the Seventh Month. Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and of course the Feast of Tabernacles. Amen? You guys are familiar with it. I'm sure Johnny's taught on it. And so we're right in the middle of that. And uh, for us especially, for me especially, the, the Feast of Atonement, Day of Atonement, is very significant. It's when... Um, I, for a number of years with Bob Jones, wrote 14 shepherd rods. And when I first met Bob in 1994, he asked me to come to his home. And um, he began to teach me about these revelations that he would get on the Day of Atonement. Now, for him, they started back in the 80s, and I won't go too much into this. But um, he, was, he had an experience with a supernatural being that showed up in his room. Now, if you don't know who Bob Jones is, he's a prophet, and these were legit revelations. And, the, and he, was, he received a, a download, you might say, of revelations. And then the next year, about the same time, it happened again from the same visitor. And finally, on about the third year, the visitor told him, I am Melchizedek. Wow. And he realized that Melchizedek was coming to him every year, three years in a row, on the Day of Atonement, on Yom Kippur. And then as a result of that, you know, we, I started writing them in 1994, grounding them, putting scriptures to it and so forth, and I wrote 14 of those. And so it's kind of a significant time, you know, for us prophetically in the church, but of course, the biggest meaning has something to do with Israel, you know, we won't go too much into all that now, but, but we're in this span of time. And the reason I mention that is because Amy had a series of dreams she may share over the course of the weekend where this year's uh, atonement season is very significant. In fact, she saw on a calendar this weekend's dates before Johnny asked us to be here this weekend. So she actually told me, and it's something about these dates, you know, she gave me the dates two or three months ago. There's, you know, in, in September, we need to watch these dates. And, of course, Johnny writes and says, here's the dates we'd like to come. And we say, yes, you know, the Lord's already told us something's going on. So I say all of that to, to build your expectation that the Lord is mindful of this weekend. Yeah. I believe that. I'm believing that something's going to happen. There's going to be, I feel like there'll be a release for this church. I believe there's going to be a release for people individually. We're going to enter a new season of time. We're transitioning from this old into the new. We've been saying that for a while, but this is very focused. We're beginning to see it very specifically now over the course of the last several weeks. We're seeing some miraculous things happening with people. People are experiencing the unseen realm in ways they haven't before. I'm trying to build your expectation that something from the other realm is going to visit us. 
that the angels would be ascending and descending and there would be a, a, a realm of glory, a realm of, of the supernatural, a realm of impartation where all of a sudden the dots are connected for you. You see it for yourself. The Lord has given me an impartation that I believe we're to release while we're here. It's like a little bubble of the Spirit comes on you and all of a sudden you see it. Oh, I got it. I can see it clearly. From Genesis to Revelations, from Matthew to the book of Revelation, I can just see this plan of God, this unfolding right before our eyes. And you see yourself in it, and you plug yourself in, and, and you position yourself in the position, the place of your grace. How, how important is it to be in the position of your grace? Your, your allotted portion. There is an allotted portion for this hour. And I want to be right in the spot where my portion is so I can take full advantage of it. And I believe that's why we're here this weekend. And so we're going to push into that. We're going to press into that a little bit over the course of, um, you know, the next three days. And, and we felt like this baptismal was a, part, was a part of that. So, Lord, I just ask your blessings upon tonight. I ask that every person's heart would be positioned before you that you ordained this meeting before the foundation of the world. I believe that. I believe That's my theology. Before the foundation of the world, the Lord knew you'd be in that seat. By his foreknowledge, are you predestined, predestined to be conformed to the very image of the one that you're being sent to serve and represent? There is a grace, there is a portion that was set apart for you Grace that was granted to us, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1 9, before time began. Before the time clock even started ticking, the Lord had an allotted portion with your name on it. And my prayer is that before we leave here this weekend, your, your portion would be released. Your grace would be deposited into your account and you begin to pull on that grace and begin to write checks on the kingdom that you would begin to do what you're called to do, in other words. That's my prayer as we step into this initial service over the course of these next three days. Lord, open the heavens. Open the heavens, Lord, and let angels ascend and descend upon the... We believe. Can you say amen? I believe. I believe in the supernatural. I believe God is a big God. I believe in miracles. I believe in the supernatural. I believe in the angelic cooperation between heaven and earth. I believe the cloud of witnesses are surrounding us, watching and even testifying of the goodness of God. I believe the word of God is living and will discern between the very thoughts and intents of the heart. So Lord, grant that I pray. Bless my wife as she shares. Fill her mouth with your words and let them flow like a river. Let there be a prophetic flow that begins to open the heavens, we ask in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Love you. Oh, so good. Lord, Abbasita. Amen. Oh, there's such a sweet presence in here the whole time since we walked through that door. I love that. I love, I have to tell the worship team, I love the fact that you guys sing throne room worship songs. That's it changes everything you know sometimes we go to meetings and the songs are good but they're more like oh you know I'm I'm this because you're, these songs are very much God you're good like songs that they're singing in the throne room holy holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come holy is he there's a sweet holiness in this place now I do believe the Lord has um like Paul Key said, he has ordained this day. It's, it's, there's something strategic this weekend that will take place. And uh, this is really the time frame of when I saw the shift coming. I saw there was going to be a shift, seven months of shifting, seven months of um, a, a door open, seven months of walking through the door, and then would be... Um, a time for seven plus years um, of a, a greater breakthrough and the greater breakthrough coming around Nissan, actually um, the third day of Passion Week. And we are mindful of that time frame, but there's seven months of preparation leading up to a greater breakthrough. 
It's, so what does it look like to walk through that door? What does it look like for seven months of moving through that door? What does that look like? It's a time of great preparation. We were a few weeks ago in um, Atlanta, and we got up to share. I was only going to share a couple of minutes because we just had one one day there, and so I was just going to share 10 minutes or so, and we both got up, and he was doing introduction. And in the middle of the introduction, I was undone. I, I saw, I would say it wasn't necessarily like an open vision. I actually just saw it was this realm, but another realm breaking into this realm, if I can put it that way. And it came from this side of the church, came in, everything looked to be cracking and shaking. And I knew that it was revelation that had, had broken in and was going to the people. And it was, it was corporate, but it was also for that, for that group of people. And they're very reverent people. They revere the Lord greatly. And the Lord was, in fact, responding to their reverence. I saw revelation coming to them. And the Lord told me that in this season of time, seven months and beyond, but specifically these seven months, the Lord is going to give revelation about places that need healing, continued revelation for the healing of the soul, so that we, we don't go into the great shift, great change with holes in our soul, but that we are whole moving into that new day. And we're all in process of that. Every single one of us, there's not one that is not in process still of healing our soul because we all took some beatings over the years. And the Lord is so faithful to heal us and have us ready for that day. Another type of revelation the Lord showed me was coming is revelation about the end times. The truth about what the scripture says, what, what day we're in, and what it's going to look like until the Lord's return. The truth about that revelation is coming. The Lord told me it's coming to those who are sincere. Those who are sincere. So if some of you are struggling, like, well, I just, I don't know. There's this option, and there's this, and there's all these things, and I'm confused. I love the fact that the spirit of truth guides us into all truth. He's just good at it. He just knows how to do his job because he's God. And that's exactly what he's going to do. He's going to guide us into all truth, the truth about what those days look like. And it's coming for those who are sincere. And the, the third thing was um, revelation coming uh, regarding the scripture. Certain parts of the scripture that you know you see um, really like faintly, but you want to see the, you want the fullness of it. You want to understand the more complete meaning of certain parts. The Lord's going to begin to bring revelation in those areas. I'll show you how the Lord showed me. He showed me a house. When you walk into a home and you look in a room and the room has the lights off, you can see the, the shape of the furniture and you can see maybe there's a lamp there, but you can't see the details of the lamp or the color of the couch or whatever it is until the light turns on you walk in that room and you can see more completely and that's the type of revelation that's coming things we've we've seen a part of we're going to see more a full picture of i want to explain that a little more as the weekend goes on but i really want to share for just a moment about walking through that door so these seven months of preparation, they're going to be a time of preparing in a throne room praying, which we will talk about throughout the weekend because it's a huge part of this shift. Not praying the way we used to pray, but praying prayers that are worthy of the golden altar. Prayers that are worthy to be hurled back to the earth with fire. That's the type of prayers we want to begin to pray, and not religiously, not by a religious spirit, but by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to not talk about that tonight, but I'm just kind of laying a, a, telling the whole big picture of what I was shown. So earlier this year, I had a week of encounters. And I'll tell you this little side note. At the end of the week, after the encounters were over, I had only shared the revelations with Paul Keith and one of our intercessors. And um, I was on the beach in Alabama the day before we were going to baptize in that very spot on the beach. 
And I was releasing them with one of our intercessors in prophetic declaration as the Lord had given them to me. And she's on the phone and she can't hear me because the waves are so loud, but she was there and it made me feel better that she was there. <laughs> so we were declaring it and she's in agreement and by the spirit. And I declared pretty much everything the Lord had showed me in that week that's coming. And the next day, um, we had a group that came in and got baptized in the Gulf. And one of the ladies got baptized. And when she came out, she had, in, had received an impartation and a revelation about what's coming. And when we later shared what the Lord had shown me, it's what she had seen. It was We were able to put words to the impartation that she received. So the Lord was doing a whole thing here. He's revealing, he's giving the revelation to each of us about what is coming. And it really is important in these seven months that we are positioned where we should be. And really that where we're to be positioned in this hour is in the secret place. It's in that quiet place with him in the secret place uh, coming and coming into this place of union with the Lord. Prophesying what's to come as he brings the revelation of what's to come. It's going to be seven months of moving through this door into the new day. I'm going to share with you. Are you tracking with what I'm saying? So seven months of, of moving through the doorway. Moving into even a greater breakthrough coming in Nissan, um, which is around Passover. And Passover's in Nissan. So during that time, that's going to be, begin a greater breakthrough, which will accelerate over the years. There will be a, a great acceleration of freedom and breaking forth into the new. There will be a healings and miracles and greater glory. There will begin to see truly the harvesters, the harvest of the harvesters that Paul Keith wrote about in his book, Angels That Gather, will begin to see this happening. Um, um, a harvest of those harvesters moving into um, a great harvest in the years to come. So can you see the whole picture? And we have this time frame where we get to prepare. And we, we don't, some people, and I'm not saying it's bad to prepare with having food and having the different things, but I'm talking about a different type of preparation. It is going to be, again, to be even darker than it already is. It's going to get darker and darker, but there is this glorious light that will shine in the darkness. And what is that light? We're being prepared. We're becoming that light, the very light of God in this season. And it will continue because we go from glory to glory into the likeness of the Lord. So it's going to continue. But there is a, this bright light. And I want to share with you what the Lord showed me on the way here. This is what he spoke. I wrote it down in my journal. The glory light is the righteousness of God revealed. Let me pause for a minute. Even though we wrote an article about this doorway, about this seven months and the years to come, I've done a video blog on it. We've both taught about it all, really all year long. We've been getting pieces of this. He's been teaching about this great light for years. And we're finally going to get to see it. And I'm building your faith here, I hope. It, it, it's almost here. But we do want to be awake and aware during this time and not fall asleep so we can get prepared for what's coming. Here's what the Lord had said. The glory light is the righteousness of God revealed. The darkness of the world is wickedness unleashed. So the light that penetrates the darkness will be purity and righteousness revealed. Remember Psalm 14 says, they have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all the workers of wickedness not know who eat up people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. They are in great dread for God is with the righteous generation. And that's your generation. That's your generation. And I just prophesy over you right now a, a revelation of this righteousness it is, it is by faith. It is righteousness by faith. Romans 1 is for you. Read Romans 1. Um, dissect it. Learn all about Romans 1. There's something you represent for your generation. It is a walk of righteousness unlike the world has seen besides Jesus. And you will do even greater things than Jesus, says the scripture. So I, get, I leave that for you. And I want to pray. Anybody, are, they, are there young ones in here? You, what are you, like 20s? Yeah, anybody 20 younger? No one's in here. They're all in the back. 
a few in the back. Okay. I'm praying the same thing for you all. This, you are a very important generation. You are um, each of you carrying a very um, strategic, um, really gift for the world, a purpose. The enemy would love to take that purpose away from you. But I pray right now and seal that purpose by the blood. Because you are important. You are important. Hallelujah. So I'm almost done. I have just a couple more minutes. Then it's all yours. Are you tracking with me? Okay. So it is righteousness by faith moving through this store. And there's an impartation for that available now. This is the weekend I saw the shift beginning. Actually, it was like the 23rd, 24th was the time frame that I was shown. But this, this is it. This is that weekend. There's a momentum that we're, is all, we're already in that momentum moving into this shift. And we're going to feel it. And it might be a little uncomfortable because a lot of things, they have to change. And one of those things is the, our prayer life the way we do prayer, and I'm not going to share on that, but probably tomorrow we will share on what um, we call Omega Prayer, what it will look like um, in this hour that we're in, this Omega time that Paul Keith has taught about. It's, um, we'll get into that more, but it's going to be important to, to allow the Lord to shift the way we pray. Just as the worshipers will worship being throne room worship, our prayers have to be throne room prayers the same way. Yes, we have the issues that we deal with every day in life, that the needs that we, we really would like the Lord to meet. But there's a shift for this generation. Everyone on the earth now, there is a shift for the remnant. We can go from this kind of praying to this kind of praying or up here. And that, for seven months, is going to shift everything. We have set up uh, prayer groups within our community to begin to pray for seven months. Seven months of praying. And not even if you get into the prayer space and you're like, I'm not, we don't know what to pray. And sometimes people start praying into all kinds of different things. But we're trying to encourage people that it's okay to go get in the prayer space and not say a thing at all. Like, that is okay, and there's something happening in us in these months preparing us for this great move. So the three things, our soul is going to be healed. The Lord is going to reveal places of our soul that need to be healed. Raise your hand if you have places in your soul that need to be healed. I've got both hands and both feet. <laughs> I'm certain. <laughs> And the, another way is we're going to start to understand the end times, understand the truth about what the scripture says. I won't tell you what happened. I'll tell a little bit. I had an a open vision when we were on the plane, and I actually had to look outside and make sure we were in the air because if, <laughs> what I saw would normally be on the ground. So, um, And what it led me to, I won't get into the whole thing, but I knew that there was something there was something to do with, the Lord was bringing truth. He's going to bring truth this weekend, truth that aligns, truth that um, sets, sets all of us on the course. Whether we've gone, we don't go to the right or to the left, but staying the course, there's a truth released. So I pray for that, Lord, and I ask that you would bring that throughout this weekend and in the months to come. Bring this truth, truth, revelation about the, the truth of what the scripture says. Reveal it to us, Lord, for righteousness' sake. For righteousness' sake, Lord, won't you reveal the truth of the Scripture to us? And the third thing is that the truth of the end times and then the truth of the Scripture. Okay. I want to pray before he comes up. I want to pray for the... Um, I want to pray that you receive the revelation as it's open to you. I had a sense that some of the, the revelation coming will be uncomfortable for the soul. Because some of the things sometimes are hard to swallow. You know, when you're, we're getting the Lord is adjusting me, I don't like it. <laughs> And um, I'm not saying that you guys are being adjusted, but when revelation comes, a new revelation, it does tweak us usually. Like, oh, wait, 
you're saying something new here I haven't heard. Doesn't really, it kind of looks like what I thought, but now I'm really fully going to receive it. Who is up for receiving new revelation from the Lord? Okay, so I pray for each one of you now. I'm asking you, Lord, won't you bring it? Do what you did even to the people in Atlanta a few weeks ago and more. This is your actual date, Lord, that you have, you have um, set aside. You have placed us here. You've honored us here, Lord. You're going to show us and bring revelation to each person in this place. Pour out your revelation, Lord. Pour it out, Lord, for righteousness' sake. Righteousness revealed bringing purity, preparing us for a great and mighty shift that's coming. Let us all receive, Lord, the truth by your Spirit. Oh, Lord. I really feel a strong uh, sense of sincerity in the people in this place now. Johnny, you'll have like a truly sincere crew here with you, sincere to receive from the Lord. And the scripture says that he'll honor that sincerity and bring truth. So is, is there some of you that you have little question marks? We all don't know the whole word, you know, completely through. But you have question marks about specific things that you've been praying into for quite some time that you really want a clear revelation about. I want to pray for you specifically because you're the ones I saw. If that's you stand, if you have like very specific kind of holes in, in some of the, the things you've been asking questions to the Lord, I want to understand this more. Okay, that's about how many I saw. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That means to me the Lord's going to do it. <laughs> if I see it before and begin to prophesy it and it, it happens the way I see it, then that's a good faith booster for me, and it should be for you. This girl in the white. You, yes. Um, I'm just going to tell you this. I saw that I saw you um, younger, and I saw somebody lied to you, lied about you, and lied about the Lord. And so I just right now, I want to break off all those lies. I break them in the name of Jesus, and I prophesy the truth is coming to you. It's coming now. A revelation of truth is coming. The spirit of truth is on you. It's on you. And every one of those lies is broken because it cannot stand in the presence of truth. So say that declaration to yourself every day. The lies cannot stand in the presence of truth. You tell yourself that daily and your soul will believe it. I prophesy that truth uh, to continue to come and open up for you. I pray for each person standing. Lord, won't you do the same? Won't you pour out your truth? In Jesus' name. That was great, sweetheart. Really good. <clears throat> um, I think that's pretty much an outline of where we're going to go. Does that sound good? <laughs> I believe the Lord is jealous over these meetings. I believe he's jealous over our destiny. I'm going to just take tonight to kind of paint with a broad stroke. Can I do that? And um, give us a little bit of a, a perspective of where we are in human history of uh, where we are in church history, of where we are biblically. What does the Bible have to say about where we're living right now? That's pretty important, wouldn't you agree? <clears throat> you know, I, I mentioned, um, you know, earlier, um, you know, we, or at least Johnny did, really, I was thinking about it. You know, I think I started coming here in 2001. Um, you know, it was the first year that I came. I believe, is that right? Is that in that, what's the first year I did the camp meeting? 2001, I believe, was the year. But anyway, 2000, um, I don't know, 12, 13, whatever year it would have been, John Paul Jackson was here. And um, it was kind of interesting because I had known John Paul for quite a number of years. But while we were here, over, it was actually over in Red Deer, but uh, he and I spent a whole afternoon together. It was just um, one of those situations where I don't know what was going on, but we were in the big suite, you know, the big uh, one with the 
that you uh, you guys put us in, and and uh, he was actually in it, and I think I was going to move in it the next day, but we hung out there in it and had a whole day together, and um, this was before John Paul knew that he was sick, and we were talking about these end-time scenarios, and he was sharing with me some of what the Lord had shown him. For instance, you know, we were talking about the uniqueness of the generation in which we're living. And he shared with me firsthand, you know, his encounter with the throne room. Now, uh, you know, can, can I just say this? We're going to go into some deep areas. Do we have permission to do that with everybody? Listen, this the hour's late. You know, we can't uh, play patty cake. We have to, you know, this is the word of God. Behold, a door standing open in heaven and a voice saying unto me, come up here and I'll show you what will take place here. I felt something on that when I said it. I felt like something opened right then. And so we're going to talk about throne room encounters because they're available to us. We're not cessationist. We don't believe there's an expiration date on the Bible. I don't believe there, the Lord went through with an eraser and started marking out verses of the New Testament. As long as we're in this age, until the age to come starts, everything they did in the first century, we can do today. There, there is no place in the Bible, I've actually had this conversation recently with cessationists, nowhere in the Bible does it say that any verse of the Bible stops being applicable. How many of you love 1 Corinthians 13? Oh, that's a love chapter. We wouldn't think about erasing that out of the Bible. Well, it's right in the middle of one sermon, including 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14, setting in order the operations of the gifts of the Spirit. Setting in the church apostles and prophets and evangelists and gifts of minist- miracles and gifts of healings. Setting in the office that if we learn to love, that everybody can prophesy. And that we're people of revelation, we're people of illumination, right? That's the Bible. And we're going to just believe it. We're gonna, I'm going to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I, you know, I, I may have done some other things wrong, but I believe your word. You know, if anything, he might say, well, you know, you believe for too much. Well, I'd rather be guilty (laughs) of believing for too much than not enough, right? Now, let me tell you what that looks like. One day, one day, this was years ago, but I got a little, I'm a little more, but I said, oh, Lord, I want to stand before you and speak to you face to face like Moses did and be a faithful friend to you like Moses was. And Lord, stretch forth your hand and fill my mouth with your words as you did the prophet Jeremiah. And Lord, give me the authority to prophesy and have throne room encounters like you did Isaiah. And I heard a voice say, you don't want much, do you? You just want to be Moses, Jeremiah, and Isaiah wrapped in one. And my response was, yes, absolutely. For sure. It's in the Bible, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it. All right? Shoot for the sun, maybe you'll hit the moon. But I believe it, right? It's in the Word. If Paul was caught up to the third heaven, maybe some of us can be. Maybe one of us in this room will be. And change our generation, right? If John was on the island of Patmos and in the spirit on the Lord's day and saw this panorama revealed of what we now call the apocalypse, so the apocalypse, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe one of us can get caught up and see what John saw. And so, yes, I believe in throne room encounters. I believe they're in the word of God. I don't believe they fall on you like ripe cherries off of a tree, but I believe if people pursue the Lord and allow him to sift them and purge them and prepare them, then yes, these encounters are illustrations of what he'll do in the last days. I believe I can support that by the Bible, that we will have more demonstration of the Spirit in the last days than they had in the first century. I believe you can support that with the Word of God, but I also believe that we're probably the least deserving of any prior generation, but going to be the beneficiaries of the greatest grace. I believe that. Now, that said, back to John Paul. (laughs) I just wanted to make sure nobody had a little questions about these things. But we were up over in that hotel. I forget now. Capri used to be what it was called. But we were in that room, and he was telling me, you know, about the day he was caught up or the series of episodes that he had leading up to being caught up in the throne room. And 
He said uh, day after day he kept getting pulled out of his body and he found himself standing in this room in heaven and he's looking here and he sees the very same scene. And he's like, where am I? Where am I being taken? He, you know, he sees this activity, but he, but he doesn't know what it is or where he is. And maybe some angels are moving around or whatever. And, but he could hear this activity you know, going on. And that happened, I don't know, he told me, but I forgot now, three, four, five times. He kept getting caught up to the same place night after night and, and day after day. And finally, he gets caught up one day and he's standing there trying to figure out where he is. And a voice says, now, turn around. <laughs> and he turns around and there sat the father on the throne. He was in the throne room. Now, I believe it. John Paul wouldn't lie. He wouldn't lie to me. And there he said, sat God. <laughs> and he said, and this is right here in Canada. He was telling me the story. He said, I'm, I'm going to try to describe it, but he says, almost like, God sitting there, and he's the, he is the uh, nucleus of an atom. Have you ever seen the, the illustrations in science of neutrons and electrons and, you know, all these electrons spinning? He said all this stuff was spinning around the Lord, and, and this, he said the, the, the throne room rumbled like an electrical transformer times a million. Just the energy and the force of it. And he said, all of a sudden, a bolt of lightning would shoot out. And he realized there was enough power in that bolt of lightning to create a universe. And an angel would come by and somehow a, um, a communication would come out and shoo, he would go down and myriads of angels and he saw this throne room activity and I can't help but believe that some of us have an invitation to, to go there. A door standing open in heaven and a voice saying unto me, come up here and, and I say that not to be self-serving but that day John Paul told me, he said, he said, Paul Keith, what you're teaching is the closest of any people that I've met to what the Lord has shown me in those encounters about end time stuff and about and there was another man and, and, and this is not self-serving it's just going to kind of lead me into what I want to share over the course of the next three days but there was another man by the name of Wade Taylor I don't know if any of you have heard of Wade but he was a outstanding he went on to be with the Lord a few years back somewhere around 86, 87 years of age but I met him first at Morningstar back in the 90s and a and, uh, very quiet man, but <clears throat> we, we became closer friends as the years went on. And, um, and he asked me to write the foreword for his last book, which I did, and he actually died before the book was published, and so I wrote it post posthumously for him. And, and he was telling me that when he was in the war, I guess it would have been the Korean War, um, is the 1950s. He was assigned to be a, um, a radio operator on the front lines. And the, mor the mortality rate of the radio operators was 90%. Nine out of every 10 died doing what he was, you know, told by the army he was going to do. And so if you're not a praying person before then, you become one. He was not a believer. He was not walking with, he's obviously a young man then, but so he made, he made a deal with the Lord. He said, uh, Lord, if you'll get me through this and let me survive, I'll serve you. And he had an experience where he was caught up before the throne. He told me this out of his own mouth as well. I'm not sharing something with you. I read in a book. And he said he was standing there and bolts of lightning came out of the throne and hit him in the chest one after another. And there was deposit after deposit after deposit of what was put into him and finally in his 80s which would have been you know mid 2000s he said I began to share the revelations that were put in me way back in the 1950s but then he said Paul Keith what you're teaching is the closest to what 
was put in me back then. And so we're going to talk about that. If, if, I'm, I'm going to trust that those men were right because I love the Bible, don't you? I love the Word of God. It's our absolute. There is nothing else that matters. I mean, as far as our theology is concerned, it is the Word, the Word of God. And I felt like the Lord spoke to me on the way here, on the flight here. You know, I think WestJet probably has engineers to engineer seats on their airplanes that are the most torturous. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I was in so much pain by the time we got here. And I started to whine. Every time I start to whine a little bit, I, I had a dream several years ago after I was whining about some trip. And in my dream, the Apostle Paul was standing in front of me poking me in the chest with his bony little finger, you know. Oh, really? You know, he started telling me what he went through in the dream. Yeah, I was shipwrecked. I hung on to a log for a day and a night in the ocean. I was beaten four times, stoned to death. And you know, Really? You had a rough flight? I'm really so sorry for you. That was in my dreams. True story. So, so today I... I told her, I started whining, and I thought about that dream, and I stopped. <laughs> but on my way here, I felt like the Lord said to start out sharing with you about rightly dividing the word, because there's not a lot of it going on right now. This is the most important hour of human history. And you might say, well, that's a big, bold statement to make. You better back that up with the word of God. I can do that. Do you realize there's about 31,000 scriptures in the Bible? And I'm going to use the word about because I'm not, I'm not all about being exact, you know. It's about, let's get it close. And over the course of several weeks and months teaching our table group, I kept making this statement that there is more scripture dealing with this time in human history than any other time ever. And I kept making that statement. There's more Bible verses. There is more prophetic application. The Bible has more, and I, you know, just making a general statement. And finally, I felt like the Lord says, well, you better be able to back that up because somebody's going to challenge you. So I did. I spent, I did a deep dive, you know. Now, here, I'm, I'm smart enough to know this. You know, I've only got so much time. So I like to find experts that spent their whole lifetime studying a subject. And, and, and then I'll find two or three. I don't take one person's word. I always find two or three, you know. So I found a couple of guys that spent years going through the Bible, identifying scriptures, the ones that applied before. I found the work of a guy named J. Barton Payne. I think he lived maybe in the 1800s and a couple of other sources, and they all said about the same thing. So would you trust what I'm about to tell you? There are about 31,000 scriptures in the Bible. Somewhere around 8,200 or so are predictive prophetic scriptures. A little over 8,000 Bible verses foretelling a future event. About 6,000 of those verses have been fulfilled thus far. Somewhere around 300 plus verses in the Bible predicted accurately the life of our Messiah. Where he would be born, just, you know, everything. I don't need to go into all that. Being born in Bethlehem, where he would, you know, minister how he would live on the Sea of Galilee, 25 predictive verses were fulfilled in the last 24 hours of the Lord's life. 25 verses of the Bible that predicted some unique aspect of his death, all of which were fulfilled in 24 hours. The odds of that are so astronomical that only God could have pulled that up. But we know that. We don't need some statistical genius to tell us God's word is accurate. We believe it already. But that's a big deal, right? So we had about 300 verses in the Bible dealing with the Lord's first coming, the most important event of human history. That leaves a little over 2,000 predictive prophetic verses of the Bible addressing the span of time we're in right now. 2,000 verses dealing with seven subjects. Now, I know our table people have heard me share this, but most of you probably have not. They are dealing with the coming of the Lord, the resurrection of the dead and the coming of the Lord, and as subheadings, what it looks like leading up to that, okay? 
So the, the first major prophetic event is the resurrection of the dead, translation of the living saints, okay? That's in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Luke chapter 20, and so forth it goes. But as a part of that, there is the perfecting of the bride that's made herself ready and the empowerment of the sons of the kingdom that will do the works Jesus did and the harvest of souls, right? While simultaneously the Bible predicts darkness covering the earth and deep darkness of the people. Okay, you're tracking? That's one event. Then you have the, the judgment seat of Christ that follows that. Then you have the appearance of the Antichrist and, the, and what we call the tribulation period or great tribulation period. Then you have the return of Christ when he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives according to Zechariah chapter 14 and the mountain splits and he destroys the army of the Antichrist. Then you have the millennial reign of Christ. You have the binding of Satan and the casting of Satan into prison, right? These are those seven events. Then you have the millennial reign. Then you have the great white throne judgment. Then you have new heaven, new earth, okay? So 2,000 plus scriptures dealing with those seven events. That's a big deal. And you're living in that hour. So now tell me we don't need to be prophetic. When there's 2,000 prophetic verses, we have to understand and apply to our lives. We must be people of revelation. It says in Joel chapter 2, you know, that you will prophesy, right? Okay. Should I go there? All right. Should I go there? My wife says yes. All right. Joel chapter 2 says, remember that's the verse Peter quotes on the day of Pentecost, I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind, your sons and daughters will see visions, your old men are going to dream dreams, I'll pour out my spirit upon your maid servants, your bond servants, and you shall all prophesy, right? But I left out the most important verse, part of that verse. After this. Can you turn there? Just, just, just go there, Okay. You go to Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And I don't know if you guys put the verses up, but it's okay. Now, what does the very first word say? It will come about after this. Whoa, most people leave that little phrase out, don't they? They just put in there, I'll pour out my spirit upon all mankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. But the very first part of that is, after this, is what it says in one place. It will come about after this. Well, you have to ask, after what? Right? After what? Go back to verse 18, you'll find out. And I can save you the time and just tell you. But I'd like for you to read it for yourself when you get home tonight. After Israel is restored as a nation. After that barren land that wouldn't produce thorns and thistles and tumbleweeds becomes a flourishing garden with olive trees and fig trees and gardens. Was it that way on the day of Pentecost? Absolutely not. When was Israel restored? 1948. Then it goes on to say, after this, but before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now you can read the whole passage for yourself. gives you the details. Now the, now the context of Joel is that they had had, you know, back when he wrote it, a horrible famine. Locusts had come through town. And they destroyed everything. So, But now the Lord is inspiring Joel to prophesy something in the future, but he's using the conditions of the locust to describe a spiritual condition. He's likening the spirit of Antichrist to those locusts that devoured everything. Beautiful trees had been planted, fruitful trees, but the locust comes in and destroys first the fruit of the tree, then the leaves of the tree, then the bark of the tree, then it gnaws into the very tree itself to destroy. But it says in verse 25 of Joel chapter 2, Behold, I will, I will restore to you all the things that the swarming locusts have eaten, the creeping locusts, the stripping locusts, and the gnawing locusts. That's four levels of maturity of one critter. Did you guys know that? It's called four molts. Are you looking at me kind of funny like I have no idea what he's talking about? Are you tracking? Give me a thumbs up if you are. If you're not, give me a thumbs up anyway. 
I don't want to get too much into this. I want to go back to my subject, except to say that there are a lot of people today that says, no, there's no more revivals. I take exception. I think Joel prophesied one. I believe the fullness of Joel's prophecy, there was an intro on the day of Pentecost. But the details of that prophecy were not in existence in the first century when Peter says, this is that. Now, you know, you know what I hear when I, when I, hear, when I read Peter's sermon in, in Acts chapter 2? Now, you know what I hear? This is that that's coming in the future. This is an intro to that when Israel is a nation but before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So you see a window of time, right? After Israel is restored, after the barren land is fruitful, but before the coming of the Lord, when he judges all of the Antichrist systems, in that window of time, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon everybody, and everybody's going to prophesy, right? That's in your Bible. That's in the Word of God. We have to, re we have to revisit that. And we have a biblical basis to believe, you know what, the Lord's going to do what he did in the first century and then some. Because that was the intro, this is the fulfillment. 2,000 biblical scriptures are talking about this thing. Why? Because it is the grand finale. It is the crescendo of God. It is what Enoch saw way back there, the seventh generation from Adam. It is what Abraham prophesied about. It is what David prophesied. I just spit all over you, I think, Johnny. <laughs> it is what David prophesied about. It is what every prophet, Isaiah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Joel, prophesied about this generation when the Lord, in his grace, finds a handful of people and he, uh, he glorifies them. Now, you might say, wait a minute now, that's a little bit. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 5. A nation you do not know will come to you. A nation that knows you not will run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. The word glorified there is beautified. He's going to beautify a body of people in the end that are called the Bride of Christ. And they're going to do everything that was spoken of in the Scriptures. They will bring in the harvest. And we're in that hour. 2,000 prophetic scriptures dealing with seven future prophetic events. And we're in that span of time. Israel's been in a nation 70 years now. So we're, we're much further into this than we think. I remember when, um, you know, I had that conversation right here, you know, with John Paul. You know, he was talking about throne room people. Throne, he felt like he was, you know, had not yet fulfilled everything that had been promised to him. And I don't know how that works, but, you know, there's many times in the Bible a promise is made that, you know, Moses was told, bring them out and take them in. Did Moses do all of that? No. He only brought them out, but there was a delay because of unbelief, Right? We're, we have been in delay. This is part of what we are bringing now. We believe delay is broken, being broken. And now there's a new generation of people emerging that are going to pick up on some promises. There's been this little bit, this span of time, you know. And here we are. We're chosen by God. I wouldn't have chosen me if I was God. But he did. You as well. Right? So... It's not going to be based upon our abilities. Our, our job is to yield. So it says in the scriptures to rightly divide the word. I don't know of any time in church history when that phrase is more important than right now. The Bible says to each of you is given a measure of faith, correct? Okay, I got some faith. All right, not right. Here's, here, I'm, I'm holding on to it, okay. You ever seen a kid when he's been given a 10 bucks and he goes into a candy store or wherever? Okay, where am I going to spend my money, right? And he looks at the, so I've got some faith. Where am I going to apply my faith? See, 
What am I going to appropriate my faith towards because I don't want to squander it. I don't want to believe a lie. I don't want to invest myself into something that has no lasting fruitful value. I want to find out what's right. I'd rather find one right thing and go for that than ten things that have no lasting value whatsoever, even if they are fluffy and, and uh, appear good on the surface. And so there's never been a more appropriate time than right now to have discernment. To have a spirit of truth to know where to appropriate your faith. And there's a lot of voices out there preaching a lot of things that aren't right. That's just a fact. You know, right, Pastor Johnny? There really are. <clears throat> I wish it weren't that way. But it is. So we need to figure out, okay, what's the truth? What does the Bible really have to say? Now, <clears throat> I was going to do a teaching here, but it's already 9 o'clock on rightly dividing the word. But, you know, I don't necessarily have to go into that. About a year and a half ago, I had a, a very vivid dream as it, it related to our table group. We have this Sunday night live service that we do on Sunday evenings. And uh, we have about 1,500 people that are part of it, you know, somewhere between three and 400 live on Sunday night, which is what we really love because we feel so connected to our live group. Some of them are in the UK. Some are in South Africa and Australia. Come on live. Some are in the middle of the night, you know. Uh, India, so other places like that. But anyway, I had this dream, and in this dream I was sitting at a table kind of like this, you know. <clears throat> and, um, and, I was, and it was like puzzle pieces were in front of me. And I was taking one puzzle piece and I was putting it here and, and I was putting the puzzle together and the Lord said, this is what I want you to do for this table group. I want you to rightly divide the word. Now, it, it's, it, this little word study I was going to do for you, it's, it's author something that I can't pronounce in Greek, but it's a certain new word that Paul used there. And it's a very unique word and they have a hard time defining it. One place they call it rightly dividing the word. In the, in the New American Standard, they call it accurately handling the word of truth. But the idea of the, of the Greek word is of a, mount, of a mine shaft. You know, you're drilling a hole in the ground and you want it to be straight and direct. In, in another place, it's like if you're an engineer building a road, the closest distance between two points is a straight line, not veering to the right or to the left. That's what the word actually means. And so the Lord gave us this admonition, he gave us this challenge that our job is to take the totality of Scripture and put it all together and make, a, you know, make the picture. In other words, if you believe this truth and this truth is an absolute, you're not going to yield on it, but you begin to have an interpretation about this group and it makes this not fit the picture, then something's wrong. Now let me tell you what the problem is. We don't have a right to interpret the word. I'm going to let that sink in a minute before you throw a tomato at me. Because what's your interpretation of Revelation chapter 2 and 3? Well, I don't have one. But I feel like the Lord has given us a revelation of it. The scriptures are not a matter of private interpretation. But men of old were moved by the Holy Ghost and spoke from God. We don't need a... a ter that's the problem. We have interpretations. And the Lord says, no, I'm going to give you a revelation of the word. And so if you put the puzzle together and you got a cow up in the top of a tree eating the leaves, something's wrong with the picture, right? <laughs> you have to take the parts apart again, put them back together where the cow is down in the pasture eating grass. And that's where we are right now. That is the job of leadership. The Lord is raising up a group of people that he is anointing. Let me just go ahead and say it plainly. That's the job of this church, this fellowship. I felt like the Lord told me flying here today that people are going to come here to get the truth. That you're going to be stewards of the truth. I had a very amazing vision several years ago. I was going to speak in a church in Connecticut, New London, Connecticut. And um, the building itself was built in the 1700s. And many of the... Um, the uh, 
not the reformers, but the, well, they were reformers. Uh, what do they call back then? I forgot. The, the word is escaping me, but, you know, the George Whitfield group. They were revivalists, but there's another word that I'm, I can't quite pull up. But anyway, some of the big names back in the day, you know, preached in this literal building. And so when I was on my way there, I had this open vision, and I, and I saw something that amazed me. I saw this man, the Apostle Paul, standing with his back to the Lord, and I watched the Lord walk up to him in my vision and drape what looked like a robe or a cloak over him. But here's what amazed me. He put it on him, and then he stepped back like this to see what he was going to do with it. I'm going to put my authority on you. I'm going to put this supernatural revelatory gift on you now. What are you going to do with it? And what amazed me was the fact that the Lord allowed him. And then I found the scripture in, in the Corinthians where he said, for, for I am a, tr a steward of the mysteries and the power of God. And as such, a steward must be found trustworthy. And I know the Lord right now is looking for stewards, trustworthy stewards upon whom he can place a mantle of revelation and power and find and say, now what are you going to do with it? You going to build your ministry? You're going to build mine. You going to, you know, bite the bullet and fight for what's really true? Or are you going to go with the flow? And I think that's the challenge that many leaders are being faced with today. But when they do, there's great reward. How, how many of you like to stand before the Lord? Say, well done, good and faithful servant. You did good. You did good. You took what I placed upon you and you, you went down the narrow path. You weren't, you know, subjected to popular opinion and, and all of the political correctness of the day. You preached the truth. And I hope... Right here in this room, the Lord can find that, rightly dividing the word. 2,000 prophetic scriptures are going to be unfolded right here in our day. Who's going to be joined into that? You know, who's going to be a part of that, you know? And, I, you know, I have this, we'll, we'll teach on it some more. I know it's getting late, but according to the Bible, it says it's going to get dark out there, but light in here. Is that the way you read it? Behold, darkness covers the earth. Deep. That's just one passage. That's the more famous one. But there's many, many verses. I, I have a whole list of them describing the conditions of the day out there. But in here, it's our greatest hour. Jesus even said this is leading up to the worst time of human history. Do you know that the worst man who's ever lived is on the earth right now? There's a man on the earth right now that is so compatible with Satan that when he is Satan is cast out of heaven, he will inhabit this man? That's in your Bible. Did you know that? Wow. And he will eventually go sit in the temple in Jerusalem that's going to be built and say, I'm God. That's why I won't give one penny to the temp Temple Institute in Israel. Not a penny. I'm not going to build the Antichrist a temple to go sit in so they can do animal sacrifices again and there's a reproach to God and this man can come sit in it and declare, it will happen, it's in the Bible, Paul said so, and declare himself to be God, no way, I'm not participating in that, it's going to happen though. But that will show you the level of apostasy in the world, but over here in the kingdom, the glory of the Lord is going to be revealed. This is what Enoch saw. A body of people, this was the grand finale, wow! I want to be a part of that. That's what those guys in Hebrews chapter 11 said. They said, I, I want to be a part of that. I've seen it. I'll even die to be a part of it. They were martyred. They were chopped in two. They were thrown in pits. They lived in holes in the ground. Wore sheep skins and goat skins and all these other things because they said, I want to be a part of that. When the Lord himself appeared for 40 days, in his resurrected form, it was so real that those people were willing to die for it. I read part of a book by a man by the name of Chuck Colson. I don't know if you guys know the name here in Canada, but he was a part of the, um, the
the Watergate thing. Remember when Richard Nixon was president? And, and you know how he became a prison? Uh, 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 you know how he became a prisoner. He, <laughs> he broke into the Democratic National Party. No, how he became a believer. When he was in prison, you know, they broke into the Democratic Convention Center for, you know, for Richard Nixon. And they got caught, a group of them. And so they all, you know, they said, if we get caught, this is going to be our story, right? They, so they all agreed, okay, if we get caught, we're going to say this, this, and this. He said that story didn't even last two days. <laughs> he said they were thrown in prison and they were all confessing this and, con, you know, turning this guy over. He said they all betrayed one another and they all went to prison. He said, but I got, to, got in prison, I read a book about the disciples that had seen the resurrected Messiah, and those guys were being burned at the stake. They were being thrown in prison. Their their belongings were stolen from them. Not one of them changed their story. He said, now that's real. He said, we couldn't keep our story straight for a week, and these guys did so for years and refused to relent because they had a revelation. And they were willing to die for it. I believe it's going to happen again today. That we'll have a revelation so great we'll die for it. We won't yield. We're not going to take money for it. We're not going to let somebody intimidate us. I believe that with all my heart. There's a grace and a glory. We're going to be stewards of what's coming. And it's going to be the greatest display of glory yet. And this is where we believe we're moving into. And I'll close with this. And I would like to pray for a couple of people. But in um, uh, 2003, in 2003, (laughs) um, I had flown across uh, the U.S. from Florida to Oregon. And there was a uh, the dedication of a building that was going on, and Bob Jones was there, and Bobby Connor, and myself, and Don Potter was leading worship. <clears throat> Maybe a couple of other leaders, I can't remember who, but I know those guys were there. And um, by the time I got there, you know, because um, you can't hardly get to Albany, Oregon from Florida. It takes all day, but the service had already begun. It was a very wide building, and probably some of you heard me share this, but Don was up on the stage leading worship, about 1,600 people. And I was brought in this side door over here. <clears throat> and I took two steps in, and my, the lenses of my eyes flipped, literally. It, like an optometrist, you know how that, bloop, they just flipped. And now I'm seeing people in the natural, but then I'm seeing the other, other realm too. While I'm walking, I'm walking across, literally looking at angels with my open eyes. And... Um, they were all about six or seven feet apart. They all looked, I was about from here to the wall from them, from that wall. So I'm looking at them and I'm realizing, okay, they look like they're about a foot taller than me. So if I was a little over six feet, they were maybe a little over seven. Some of them had on white robes with a golden sash, but some of them had a golden rope-like thing around their waist. And they didn't look scary. I mean, they looked powerful, but not scary. And I said, Lord, who are they? Like that. And immediately, they are angels that gather. Like that. That's just the way it came. And I'm like, I've never heard that before in my life. Never heard anybody teach on angels that gather. Never heard that phrase that I'm I'm aware of. And so I got on the front row, and I had a little Franklin Concordance back then. You know, you don't have your iPads then. So I Googled. I'm not Googled. I um, put in my Franklin, you know, angels and gather. And there it popped up right there in Matthew 13. I'll send forth my angels that gather out of my kingdom everything offensive and every stumbling block. Then I saw it again, of course, in Matthew 24. I'll send forth my angels that gather the elect from the four corners of the earth. And then shortly after that, I had a, not the same night, but a few days later, I had another vision where the Lord gave me Genesis 41. And I saw, you know, the seven years. And the Lord gave me the phrase. This was the first time I'd heard this phrase. 
harvesting of harvesters. Now, Bob Jones borrowed it and made it popular. <laughs> but I'm the one that told Bob. And I said, Bob, you used my phrase. I'm going to put that in my book. Don't go preach it. Not, at least not until my book comes out. But anyway, he used it, and everybody, you know, got, got used to the phrase, harvesting of harvesters. And what I saw it was there will be seven years and I even said, I don't know if it's a literal seven years or if seven years is symbolic uh, of, of a season of completion, but a season that I thought were seven years for Joseph of, of harvesting harvesters. They were the wheat. Remember, Joseph gathered wheat. It says in Matthew 13, the very passage that I was quoting from, that the, the sons of God are like wheat. The wheat are the sons of the kingdom, right? So the gathering of the wheat, the sons of the kingdom, and it says in Genesis 41 to gather them and guard them for a season. Gather the wheat and guard it. And this is where I got the whole apostolic hub thing. The storehouses were apostolic hubs. The overseers that Joseph spoke of were apostolic leaders given authority to go into the wheat fields around the hubs to gather one in five, to gather them and to guard them, to equip them, because then... There is coming a season of great darkness, and when that happens, you're going to open the barn doors, turn loose the wheat, and you'll have the greatest harvest the world has ever seen. I still stand by that. I believe that's the, the model of the harvest. I do. I believe it's coming in two waves or two seasons, a season of harvesting harvesters, and then, of course, the great harvest in times of great difficulty. That's the patterns of the Old Testament, even. It was in times of famine that Egypt became the most powerful nation on the planet because of the strategies of Joseph. Brought in all the wealth of the entire world, you know, so forth it goes. And so this is, when she had this uh, these series of dreams recently, we felt like, well, this is the pattern. This Whether it's seven literal years, whether it's more or less of that, I don't know. But we're entering that span of time, and I believe part of what the Lord is doing now is identifying people and places that he, that he will make trustworthy stewards. And that's why we're here tonight. To lay that vision in front of you so that you can pursue the Lord to become a trustworthy steward, that he would put something on your life. And he may just step back and say, okay, what are you going to do with it now? What are you going to do with it? The gifts and callings of God placed upon him. And he's looking for places where he can begin to gather those people in that he's going to train to be trustworthy stewards. And I, one thing I know about it, one thing the Lord's told me, he's not going to let the people out in the world that haven't gotten saved yet to come into a religious institution. It's not going to happen. Just not going to happen. We've had the last of that. He'll, he'll postpone it until we have some place for those people to come in. And that's been part of the reason for delay. That's really true. So, Lord, I pray that you'll find what you're looking for right here. You know, and sometimes it's okay to say, here, my Lord, send me. You know, I don't have anything better to do on this earth. Not just send me to do this or go home. The world has lost its allure. I feel that way, I think. I think I do. I, I don't, you know, is there anything out there that's worth doing anymore? Us older folks are saying, no, for sure. We've tried it all. You know? so I've, I've, done it. I've done the golf thing. That didn't satisfy me. I did the hunting thing. That didn't satisfy me. I, I, was, I was fisherman of the year on the Gulf Coast. I did the tournament circuit, caught all kind of blue marlins and everything. That didn't satisfy me. So for me, I'm like, I'm old enough to know that stuff ain't going to work. You know, some of the younger guys might say, well, you know, but take it, take, take it from us. There's something much better. And there's something woven into our DNA. So I believe, I feel, I have felt several times tonight up here, angelic activity. It's pierced me sometimes. I've almost wanted to, you know, get a little emotional, but I've had to push it back, but that's my cue that the angelic are here. That another realm is here when it makes you real sensitive and tender. You can feel that dimension of the spirit that's here. So I'm going to ask, Lord, and um, 
Have I prophesied over you guys before? Do I prophesy over you every time I come here? Okay. <laughs> There's something on you. I'm not kidding. I, you know, and I probably said that last year. But I'm going to pray this year that uh, you step into it, that you guys can begin to step into that dimension of whatever it is that's over you. And this dimension, and one of you is a dreamer, a big dreamer. I see a lot of dreams. I feel like there's, there's interpretation of the dreams that's coming. And maybe the dreams will even move over into visions, you know, where they're not only internal but external as well. And so let them begin to move into that to that realm, I pray, Lord, in, in Jesus' mighty name. And I don't know which one of these guys you were prophesying over, but this young man with a, you know, there's something on you. I just want to release that destiny and purpose and calling on your life. Is that your son, Craig? Oh, man, I didn't realize that. Okay, I see it now. Y'all are sitting together. <laughs> Duh. But, I mean, when I was looking at, when I was preaching tonight, I kept, you notice I looked over at you. And so that was me, the, the anointing pulling me because what I was saying was for you. You're part of that generation of people, so I want to le- release it on your life, that you'll step into that purpose and that you'll step into this destiny and that you'll find out there's nothing in the world better than walking with the Lord Jesus and living in that supernatural dimension with the door standing open, a voice say, come up here and I'll show you something. Don't you feel that dimension of being a, an explorer in the Spirit? I want to see those things. I've always felt that way. From the time I got the Holy Spirit in 1989, you know, I felt this. I want to see what John saw. I can't help it. You put it in me, Lord. So isn't it deep calls to the deep at the sound of the waterfall? When I hear about, you know, John being caught up, it stirs me up. What's the sounding of the deep stirring something in me and, and in you as well? And so I pray that we will begin to walk in that. So, Lord, I bless everyone here. And ask that there, there's been a little bit of a grace over the last week um, for a revelatory deposit. But it's unique. It's like a little bubble. I, I, I stepped into it a couple of times this week where that little bubble of revelation comes on you. And it's like everything is so clear. Like I want to stay in the bubble because everything's so perfectly clear. But you come out of it and you're like, oh, it gets a little foggy again. But, but I'm going to pray that bubble over you, that you would begin to walk in that. I, I see, Joe, you're, you're here from, um, from um, over on the east side, over, you know, I know that. So, Lord, I, I want to pray that over you. Is that your wife, uh, your new wife? Okay, well, I want to bless you guys. Thank you for coming from all the way across Canada. The Lord's going to bless you. I know that much of what I was speaking to you, you felt that inclination of this about your destiny. And, and um, are you being baptized tomorrow? You are? Okay, I feel like you should. I really do. Whether you were or not, I feel like you need to be, and I didn't know for sure, but the washing away of the old, stepping into the new, slamming one door and opening another. This is the hour of the open door. We've been prophesying that, so I, I want to bless you guys. We'll, we'll bless you tomorrow, pray over you, but I want to do so tonight in this, um, in this atmosphere. So, Lord, we release it in Jesus' name. May the angelic host begin to, to visit with us. I want to pray for visions and dreams and revelations for all of us here tonight. Grant that, I pray, Lord. Um, brother, you're, you're Bill, right? No, this, uh, no, no. Rich. Rich. Yes, Rich. Okay. Bill, Bill's over there. Got it, got it, got it. All right. Sorry about that. Um, but there's that little trio right there. There's a little cloud right over the three of you. Um, so it's, I feel like it's a revelatory dimension. I'm not saying that you guys will be joined together in prayer. And I'm just saying it's right there. This little, um, this little deposit of grace for this new season. Yeah, I knew that, Rich. I, I remember. Um, but there's something about this for now for you guys. Um, and I just want to release it. Just by acknowledging it, saying it, I believe releases something for you to step into the new day and uh, in the, into the new anointing. That's kind of a cliche thing, but it's really true, that we are kind of washing away the old, stepping into the new, and um, which means we're not going to make the same mistakes we made in the past. And, and we've learned something along the way. And there's a lady uh, straight back. You've got uh, hair kind of one side and the green shirt. Uh, yep, you just put your hand up there. That's you, yep. Sorry if I didn't describe you the right way, but I just see it on you as well, okay? I'm waiting for the day when the Lord gives me the names of people. I've, I've had it before, and I'm really asking the Lord for that. 
Um, I've, I've had a couple of times where names came. I want the Lord to restore that. And uh, well, not to just restore it, to release it in a big way. But anyway, I just want to point you out that there's something going on for you tonight as well. And uh, there's a grace package for you to step into over the course of the next seven, ten days. I don't think it's going to be an overnight thing, but I believe over the course of a little less than two weeks, probably, things will begin to, to take shape and you'll see more clearly what the Lord has released into your life. I feel like he's going to answer a lot of questions for you. So you have a lot of questions, I believe. So Lord, grant that, I pray. You got something? Thank you. I'll say these real quick, and then I was going to share a vision I had um, and a scripture I got when you were speaking. But he ministered over you guys. And what's your name, honey? Yeah. Jacqueline? Okay. Um, I saw um, a, a, a picture uh, when he was uh, praying and ministering to you guys. And I saw... Uh, like a thin layer of what looked like maybe like a wall and you felt like you were up against this wall and but it was very thin and very movable but the wall seemed much more um, like you wouldn't ever be able to move it it was very deceptive but I just want to reveal the truth about that thing whatever that situation is that you're up against obviously by your face you know what it is <laughs> no you don't Well, I'm just going to go with what I'm, I'm not going to say anything extra than what I saw. What I saw was that this thin, this thin layer here that looks like a big major wall that you can't move is it's movable. And so it just released that truth in Jesus name. Yes. Lord, won't you do a quick work of healing? Let it be God. It is your will, Lord. It is your will, so won't you do it in Jesus' name? Oh, and you prophesied over the gal with the hair and the name and the green. Next to you, can you wave to me? What's your name? Anne Marie. It's a pretty name. Um, I saw a word written over your head. I saw faithful friend. And um, I had this, I could feel the adoration from the Lord for how you've been a faithful friend. And there were, were many that maybe weren't so as faithful to you, but you've been faithful and you've stood and you've loved well. And um, I saw this sense, of, I felt this sense of you have been a faithful friend to, to many and the Lord stands and he is a faithful friend to you. And I believe that there's a, even a closer friendship with the Lord that you're moving into in this season. The revelation that's coming to you is going to be in that area, um, a faithful friend, uh, a friendship, uh, um, a, a walking even hand in hand with the Lord in that sweet way. A sweet season is ahead for you. The last season was not as sweet to you and the season before even less sweet but this season is going to be a sweet season so I release that to you I want to share real quickly the vision can I share that real quickly what I have when you were ministering okay, one okay. Uh, the sister in the little red right here can I pray for you real quick but I, I want to lay hands on you um, I know we're not we're kind of just prophesying out but I felt like the Lord said to take you by the hand and to release something how are you doing I'm good do you believe what I was talking about tonight all right, you believe that, really? Because I believe he's going to release something to you tonight. One time I had an angel come and take me by the hand, just like this, 1992, way back. I was 12. Release something. Okay. Now focus on the Lord. It's, it's a gift to go into the realm of the Spirit. Do you feel like you want to go into the realm of the Spirit? To awaken all the seeds of destiny, all the generational blessings that's on your life. Some of the generational things may not have been felt like a blessing, but this is going to be picking up the blessings of your generations. When, we, um, when we're born again, you know, it, the curse is broken to the third and fourth generation. They're going all the way back to the third and fourth generation. You understand what I'm saying to you? Going back all the way to those years that all the things that could have been yeah. will now be coming forth in your life. So the Lord says you're going to be a token uh, of a generational blessing. And you feel like, oh, I have been a lot of blessings. This is going to be a blessing. Focus. Just focus on the Lord.
If you're not a black sister, you're not getting prayed for tonight. <laughs> kidding, kidding. So good. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to i just share the vision that I had. I think that I, I feel it's important in a picture for you all in these next seven months. So when he was praying, I had a vision. And um, when they've been happening, I, I break into tongues. Sometimes I am in tongues on the airplane by myself. Coming back from Atlanta, I kept breaking into tongues. And I'm like, God, this is embarrassing. <laughs> You've got to help me with this. Or like, this lady's crazy. But I had, um, I had a vision sitting there and I broke into the spirit. But in the vision, I saw um, a knife, like a sword, like that double-edged sword, a double-edged knife sliced through the middle of the atmosphere here. But I had a sense of a, of a, a cutting um, according to John 15. Um, I'm going to read it here. I'm the true vine, my father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire. And it goes on. And it says this, just as the father, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. And it's about the father's love. So in this season of time, when the, the things that are not true are cut off and the things that we don't need to hold on to anymore or never should have had are cut off in the time of the slicing of the Hebrews 4.12 double-edged sword dealing with every part of our soul and aligning us in the things of the spirit as those things take place over this course of uh, the course of this time and moving into the years that he's prophesied about for so long and the scripture talks about during this time frame it's because he's giving a revelation of the father's love it's a revelation of the love of the Father that we might come to the place of the unity of the faith, the true knowledge of God, and the place of abiding with Him. True abiding like we haven't really done before. We've tasted moments of it, but we haven't walked in a place of abiding. So everything that's taking place in this weekend and in the seven months ahead and the years beyond, but specifically these seven months, a cutting off of the things that are not needed and a placing, uh, we're coming into this place of abiding with him. So I pray that for you. Um, I ask you, Lord, won't you do it? We long to abide with you, God. We long for it. We long for it. We long to abide with you, Lord, because you are holy. You are God. There's none like you. There's none like you, God. There is none like you. We long to abide with you. So, Lord, cut whatever needs to be cut. Come and break through, Lord, on our behalf, bringing us into a place of truth unlike we've ever walked in before, that we might know the Father's love in Jesus' name.